Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the 17th of Ramadan. MashaAllah. I hope you're all well. This is our daily program, in case you just stumbled upon us, called Hadith Ramadan Al Yomi or Daily Ramadan Talks. For the most part, we're looking at there was a radio program in the last century run by Sheikh Bashir Al Bani, who then turned it into a book. And then now I'm turning it kind of, sort of, into an Instagram, although uh, we are expanding quite a bit on what's in the book. We are beyond the halfway mark. Yep, you're right. It's the 17th of Ramadan. Today actually is commemoration of the Battle of Badr. We had at Rabata Masjid today a beautiful talk by my very good friend, uh, Antirendu Mardini. It was a really good talk, mashallah. Like it was really beneficial. I'm going to summarize it a little bit for you here in case you missed it because it was not recorded. Well, actually it was recorded, but it was not recorded for public use. So it was only recorded for private use. All right. Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I hope you are all well. So uh, for our book, I just want to make the connections across the board. Yesterday, we started talking, if you remember, I'm just going to open it up. To about this, about the Quran, how this is Shahr al Quran, this is the month of the Quran, and this is the month of where the Quran came down. And yesterday we talked about the blessing of the Quran, if you remember. I can't seem to find the actual page, but that's okay, I will find it later. The I, what I want to talk about today. Here we are, we're almost there now. This book has, I actually, we didn't go over it together. It has many, many pages about Rifiq. Do you remember when we were talking about Rifiq? Many, many, many pages. And I was reflecting on that the other day because it's, it's not something we talk about so much now, maybe. And I was thinking how in the last century, there was so much harshness, really, in Muslim communities. And how important it was that he was writing and talking about rifq, about gentleness and goodness in relationships. I don't know if you were around in the 90s, but boy, it was a harsh and difficult time for, for in the Muslim Ummah. Alhamdulillah, we are now in a different age and a different stage and working and growing in different things. So yesterday we talked about how uh, this is Shahr al-Quran. Remember, غاشيكم. it's cover Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers you and Rahma comes down and our sins are removed, our dua is answered. Okay. So you remember this from yesterday. Now uh today I want to both continue that theme and talk about Badr because it's Badr and I don't want to we I don't want to I want to make sure to commemorate that. I want to share some of the things that Ansarenda shared today, and I want to tie it back to this idea that the Quran is our great blessing of this month. Okay, so that's our that's our trajectory for today. All right, so kul amuntu bakhir for the celebration or the commemoration of the Battle of Badr. Ansarenda today in her talk, she talked about how. The word ghazwa in Arabic is what we use when the Prophet ﷺ was with his companions and he went out. It's not always used when a battle happens. Sometimes there's a battle and sometimes there isn't. But when we talk about Badr, it was indeed a battle. And the very beautiful takeaways that I want to share with you are that we are, there are things we have to do to, to succeed in our life battle. And one of these things is this idea of knowing what we're facing. And that's where I'm going to talk about today, that piece right there. Because she said that, subhanAllah, the people that went out to Badr, at first, they didn't know what they were going to. They thought they were going to waylay a caravan, which is part of the strategy of defense against the, the real um, uh, harmful intentions of the Quraysh, the sort of state of war of the peninsula is the way to say that. And instead, they went a different route, and now they were facing 
an enormous army. They were only 313 people, 314 people, and the kuffar were over a thousand. So what to do? And it was a period of time in between when they thought they were doing one thing and they realized they were going to battle. And so she mentioned how this is very important in the self in self-development, in the battle to grow ourselves, if you will, the struggle to make, to grow ourselves. And in these days of Ramadan, it's really important that we talk about this struggle. Now, we here in this space are going to talk about Rafiq. So I'm going to bring Rafiq in because I feel like that's the, we still have that um, place where we don't bring Rafiq, which is in the struggle with ourselves. But first, let's recognize that it is a battle. First, let's recognize that and look and notice what are we battling against? What are the things we're struggling against? She said something else really beautiful. She said, in a battle, there is something that it, there isn't always, it doesn't always have to be um, killing. Sometimes the other side can surrender. And so here are the things we battle against. One is shaitan. Now with shaitan, we don't, we're not looking for shaitan to, to uh, surrender, though historically we have some, some narrations that that has happened in very rare cases. What we're looking for when we're battling shaitan. Now, Badr, I want you to, and I, I want you to think about this. This is Badr today. We're commemorating this. We're battling shaitan. In Ramadan, not so much. So what we're doing in Ramadan is we are building ourselves up so that when Ramadan is over, we are ready to battle shaitan. We are not just going to be listening to shaitan, letting shaitan come in and talk to us. I have a book recommendation for all of you, and maybe we'll do a, uh, a little book club here. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? To do like a monthly book club where we talk about a book together. Let's think about those things. Anyway, the book I want to recommend to you is a very old book, and it's a book written by C.S. Lewis. So it's not a Muslim book. It's actually a book written by a practicing Christian. And it is full of Christian metaphors and aqidah. So I want to let you know that before I recommend the book. But it also, it's really good in reminding us of the real sort of planning that shaitan does in an attempt to, to harm us, in an attempt to waylay us away from surat al-mustaqim. And it is called the screw tape letters. It is called the screw tape letters. So I don't, I mean, I'm not saying I should, you, you want to necessarily read this in normal dawn. Maybe for Eid, you want to grab it and read it real quick and be like, whoa. But do, I want, what I do want you to do in this month, what I do think we should do in this month is really build up who we are. Like if we were, if we are soldiers on this path against shaitan, what kind of soldier do we want to be? What kind of soldier do you want to be against shaitan? And who will win against shaitan? Like, think about that. You've seen, I'm sure, plenty of movies and television about soldiers fighting this or fighting that. Who wins? It's the superheroes <laughs> and the Jedis that win the wars. It's the Jedis and the superheroes. Those are the ones who are winning. So if we're going to win against shaitan, we need to be a Jedi knight, a Jedi master, or a superhero. That's what we need to be. So how are we going to do that? And I'm saying that, subhanAllah, I'm not saying that like, oh, that's an impossibility, by the way. I'm saying that is that's what we must become. I've been teaching for two semesters. I taught at Ribat. A cl one class was called Superwoman. Uh, what, was the, what was the tagline? Superwoman, Powers, Kryptonite, and Karamat. And then the second semester, that's where we looked historically at Superwoman. And then this semester was a very pragmatic, practical one about how to become superwomen. And together we learned about that. And of course, it's not the superwomen of the movies. Okay, this is not about Marvel. This is the superwoman of our history. This is becoming strong against shaitan. And Ramadan is a perfect time for that. So this is when you want to work on your worship. Make sure that your, your, your tarawih, if you haven't been praying tarawih every night, make your intention. Starting today, you're going to pray 20 rakahs of tarawih every day for the last 13 days of Ramadan. Bismillah. 12 to 13 days. Because if we're only 29 days, then there are only 13 days left. 12. Oh my goodness, I can't add. So make your intention, tarawih, to strengthen you. 
Quran. What are, what are you reading of Quran this month? To strengthen you, to give you those superhero qualities, to make you a Jedi master. That's from Star Wars, by the way, for those of you who don't know what I'm referring to. Where is your, your um, lightsaber? Uh, and Sarenda talks about how at Badr, the angels came down and they actually fought, which is something unique to Badr, according to most scholars. And how you could tell by those who were killed by the angels that they had a different scar. It was different than human. So we need special weapons to fight shaitan. We need special weapons. And that, those are the weapons of Quran. Those are the weapons of worship. Those are the weapons of our inner strength. If you can't read Arabic, then say, okay, I, what I'm doing is I'm registering for an Arabic class. I'm not sure if registration is still open for our Arabic class that is happening in May. But if it is, register for it. You, if, if you are a novice, you're going to learn how to read Quran. That's going to get you started in this beautiful year where you are a strong soldier against shaitan. Who else are we battling? So we're battling shaitan. The other battle is the battle against the nafs or the ego. This is the one where we hope to, to, to have it submit, to surrender. Let our nafs surrender. Surrender itself to Allah. Yes, our nafs. What is our nafs? What is this ego of ours? This is our, our arrogance, our self-pride, our need for appreciation, our need for people to clap for us, our, um, our desires, our hawa, our, all these things that we, it's, and it's a lot. It's a lot because we live in a society that teaches us that we need all of that. We live in a society that teaches us that to serve others and to put ourselves second doesn't make sense. And actually, I want to say something. Oh, yes, anger and resentment. Good. I want to say something about this. It doesn't make sense to put ourselves second if we're putting another human being first. Of course, that doesn't make sense. But what makes sense is to put ourselves second and put Allah first because when we put Allah first then all of humanity and the good deeds of this world from the environment to caring for others to caring for people's spirits to caring for their hunger everything will come will will be there for us to serve so we want to put Allah first we want our nafs we talk to our nafs and say hey nafs Hey, nafs, salamu alaykum, ya nafsi. <laughs> I'm offering you a beautiful life of joy and peace and love and connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have to work with me. You have to work with me. We need, you, we, you have to focus on Allah, yes, Sufiya, beautiful, seeing Allah before we see others. Absolutely. Work with me, ya nafs. Let's focus on, on what will bring us long-term satisfaction because long-term satisfaction is what we're really looking for. I once had a teacher who said in our class, everyone wants their maslaha. Maslaha means their personal benefit. And I was a little offended actually when she said that. I was like, wait, what? Wait, what? What about how we're all supposed to be doing good for others? We're supposed to be thinking outside of ourselves. But then she finished her sentence. She said, when you know that your maslaha is the next life, then the way you live in this life changes. I was like, okay, I get the point. I get the point now. So when we, if we know, we can talk to our nafs, yeah, nafs. Understand the reality of the next life, just as the transition from life in your mother's womb to this world happened through birth, the transition of life in the grave from this life will happen through death or al-barzakh. And just like that will happen, also the transition from al-barzakh or the life in the grave to the, to the everlasting life will happen through yawm al-qiyamah, the day of judgment. And as you can see in this, this life is just a small part of that. So talk to your nafs. 
Now in 12 days, talk to yourself, say you're not, we're, we're not going for desire and hawa anymore. We're going for long-term maslaha. We're going for the pleasure of Allah. And oh nafs, with this I give you happiness. That's the beauty of this. The fighting or the bringing the soldier to the nafs, the end result is happiness. As is fighting shaitan. The end result is being done with all of that waswas and all of that. Ugh. Just talk to us like I right now. Say, hey, nafs, we're not sleeping as much as we want all the time, okay? We're going to work into it. Hawa is desire, whims and desires, like the thing that blows you one way or the other. Right now I have a whim for this. No, we're going to finish the project, whatever it is. And so we're going to talk to our, we're going to say, hey, nafs, I can give you happiness, real happiness, not just the moment happiness, not the happiness of a Snickers bar, the happiness of long-term, deep happiness. Imagine, try to remember a moment in prayer when you really connected or in dhikr, or in Qur'an, or with someone, something, a moment you really connected. Imagine that moment expanding. Expanding. And being able to live in that moment all the time. Imagine. So talk to your nafs, say, yeah, nafs. I offer you the most beautiful experience. But we have to walk away from these temporary satisfactions. The satisfying of the anger by saying something nasty to somebody. The, the breaking of pride by going to someone with an apology, even if it's been a long time. I had, mashallah, I had, there was an imam who in 2012 um, made a little bit of trouble for me. And he sent me an email, I think two years ago. So like eight, nine, ten years later. And apologized. And I was so impressed with him. MashaAllah. That took a lot. It took a lot. And it, it means, it, I mean, that's, that's a person who really sees the next life. He, people can be safe with him. MashaAllah. And so when we, when talk to your nafs. Like, do those things that go against the nafs, that go against self-pride. And you will find yourself, and just, even in sadaqah, the other day I was at a, a fundraiser where, I told you guys this yesterday, but I'll, I'm sharing a little more about it now. Ubaidullah Evans was talking about how giving money should hurt. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I think he's right. And there was this really cool, um, well, there was a cool program. And so I decided, yeah, I'm going to give, um, I'm going to give some, I'm going to give more than what is easy for me. And I came home with such a good feeling, such a good feeling. Of course, I do, did the same for Rabata, do the same for, I tried to support as many organizations as I can that I believe in their, in their mission. Uh, anyway, so in the giving, you go against your nafs, like just a little more than what's easy. That's another thing. And by the way, we have a match this weekend at Rabata, launchkit.com forward slash Rabata. We have two amazing women who are here to match us up to $25,000. So calling out to you to help us make that match. Jump on there to launchkit.com forward slash Rabata and help us make that match. And uh, yeah, in this very exciting Badr weekend. And give a little more than what's easy for you because that those kinds of things are the things that Oh, they bring those feelings in. And I saw a question here. Um, you're saying you're a new Muslim and you've been waking up for suhoor and then fajr every day, but it's really draining you. Is it haram to pray fajr when I wake up in the morning? So first of all, I want to welcome you. Welcome, new Muslim. I'm so happy to be your sister. I'm so happy to be walking together on this path together. I'm so excited to meet you one day in person. And I'm so excited for you to discover all of the beautiful spiritual opportunities in this faith. Now, uh, you're getting drained from getting up earlier than you're usually. It's kind of like a little Ramadan jet lag. 
that's what we call it, a little Ramadan jet lag because our schedule changes. And I don't know if you're able, if you're staying up late at night as well. But I think my first recommendation for you would be try to go to bed a little bit earlier because it's when you get up for support, you do get that just a little extra oomph in the day. Take some vitamins, maybe have your coffee at that time so that you feel like, oh yeah, I've got some of that normal stuff I have in my system for this time of day. Um, I, I recommend those things. Now, if, if you really can't get up that extra early, Fajr is an hour and a half. It starts at, well, here in Minnesota, it's starting around 5.20 now, 5.15. And it goes for an about an hour and a half. So if you're really struggling, one thing you can do is you can say, okay, I'm not going to price, I'm not going to eat suhoor. And of course, I'm recommending that you do, but just if you don't, if you really feel like you need that sleep. And then what you can do is you can wake up towards the end of Fajr and you can pray before the sun comes up. And then you're totally fine. If you do miss it, so then you wake up later, then it's called a qada prayer. That's a makeup prayer. So you're making it up. It's not exactly the same as doing it on time. I hope that that was helpful for you. And uh, yeah, so I don't know what you guys are having for suhoor, but uh, around here, once we hit the 17th of Ramadan, in the beginning of Ramadan, we're like oatmeal with walnuts and I don't know what, sprinkles of healthy stuff. And now we're like a piece of bread and butter with some tea. Because <laughs> everyone's getting tired. But um it might be helpful as well to have maybe your leftover dinner from last night or maybe some soup that might be easier to get down and to give you that oomph or just maybe vitamins, you know, maybe vitamins. And yes. Okay. So back to our, we're talking about fighting the nafs. So working with the nafs, okay. Working with that nafs, growing that nafs so that we can, fighting that nafs and knowing there's a battle to be had. Now it's just like, look, when you go on a diet, okay. And I know 98% of you have been on a diet. You're on a diet and you're like, okay, what am I going to do to fight the cravings? Now, by the way, I'm not really into diet culture, but I know that so many of us are, have been, (laughs) have experienced it. So, um, what I really would suggest for that is take note of that. How do you respond when you're on a diet? You're like, you're struggling. You're like, nope, I'm not going to eat. Nope, I'm going to do this. The same struggle, that struggle to fight the nafs and to grow ourselves is what we want to do. And we want to know there's a struggle and a battle there that needs to happen. Now, the third battle that we must face is the battle with dunya. What is dunya? Dunya is this world, this material world we live in that comes to encroach upon us and tries to make itself the most important thing. So if you look around at this world, like all the things, you know, oh, oh, I have to buy this. I have to buy that. I need this thing. I need that thing. I need this. I don't know what. Now, some things, of course, we need. And some things are a blessing to your family to get for them. And some things are just extra. So we need to be able to battle the encroaching of the dunya so that it, we don't want it to take over us. I think you know, if we talk about the Star Wars metaphor and you think about some of those, that, those big worms that would come and eat or, and encroach upon and just eat everything in its path. That's kind of what dunya is. And so we want to battle that. We don't want it to take over. We want to stay in a space of spirituality and connection to Allah in a space of deen. We want to, the, the, um, the, the early scholars, Junaid and people like that, may Allah be pleased with them, they were very particular about this. And they, they said that the Muslim must learn, I'm paraphrasing, how to live in the world without being in the world. Excuse me, while being in the world. I totally messed that up. <laughs> Let me repeat it. That the, the believer must learn how to be out, have her heart connected to Allah, not connected to the world, while living in the world. That's our goal, to be able to live and serve 
Live with your family. Go to work. Go to school. Serve your community. Learn. Teach. But the whole time, you're fully, you're just with Allah. You're just there. And you know God is with you. Ihsan. That's what Ihsan is. You know Allah is watching. You know Allah is with you. you that connection is right there. No matter where. And you're, you're deeply working in this world to please Allah. But you're fully connected internally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the third battle. And of course, the fourth battle is the, is the, those who seek to hurt Muslims, to hurt Islam, we want to be ready to battle them. You know why we called Ribat? Ribat? The, that Ribat is our academic program at Rabatam. And Ribat has many meanings. There are lots of beautiful meanings, actually, that I've learned. But one of them, of course, is the Ribat is the front lines. And today we are in a cultural war. We are in a cultural war. There's a, it is, there's a war against um, spirituality. It looks like you guys have lots of questions, so I should probably respond to your questions. And I will, just one moment, okay? And so ribat is this women standing together at this cultural war and bringing it, bringing to it ilm, knowledge, ibadah, worship, and sisterhood. And traditionally, or research tells us that women are the ones who bring forth culture and who change culture. So that's what we're doing at Rabota. So get on over to launchgood.com forward slash Rabota and donate and help us do this work. Because it's very, very important work. And it is making great changes. Just today I was noting in one of the report systems that we have how many other organizations now are doing the kinds of things we started doing 11 years ago. So launchkit.com forward slash rebel talk. Okay, I'm going to answer some of your questions now. I'm scrolling up to see your questions. Pride and arrogance diminish with ibadah over time, even though we're not directly working on it. That's a really good question. And it is true that one of the weapons, if you will, against pride and arrogance is heavy ibadah, not just a little bit here and there, but like sitting in dhikr for a period of time, sitting with your Qur'an for a period of time. These help us to get over pride and arrogance. And I think especially if you're not a native Arabic speaker and you're studying Arabic, that's going to help you get over pride and arrogance. How do we get out of the me mentality? Get into the Allah mentality. Just keep thinking about Allah. I actually will recommend to say, La ilaha illallah. Now the last 12 days of Ramadan, try to say it as much as you can. As much as you can. Let me see. What's better to finish Aisha or go to bed at 10.30, wake up at 3.30, step after Fajr and Ibadah, Masjid Tarawiyah, finishing post midnight? I can't answer that question because that is going to be personal for you. You have to really, I mean, I'll tell you what though, if you are uh, worried about not praying Fajr, then no, it would be better to go to bed early. And pray whatever tarawih you can at the end of the night. Because tarawih is sunnah and fajr is fadl. So, But you need to set up your schedule the way it works for you. And that's what we all have to do. Thank you so much. I'm curious to know if you lived in Syria for a while. Oh, just a little while. 20 glorious, amazing years. I miss them. A lot, but I'm very grateful for where I am today. I'm very grateful for where I am and being here with you today. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. Let me see. Okay, look, I think we're done. Yep, that's all the questions I saw. So if you put a question in and I missed it, please put it in now. And uh, I will try to answer it. And while I'm waiting for those questions to come, the ones that I missed... Uh, I, I'm going to remind you again, we want to make our match. Go over to launchkit.com forward slash Shobota and support the work that we do because the, support, the work that we do is the work we all need. It's the work we all need. I remember last year we had a Rabba Teens workshop for teens about gender issues. Can you imagine how important that was? It's so important that we are able to talk with our young people and even for all of us, subhanAllah. There is just so much going on in the world today that wants to take us away from truth. What advice do you give to young Muslims when they think Islam is hard and being Muslim is hard? 
Well, I think, first of all, of course it's hard. <laughs> of course it's hard. In this day and age, of course it's hard. Because we're surrounded by people who were secularism is the goal and having fun is the goal. And Islam has the goal pleasing Allah. It's hard, but the most valuable things are hard. They wouldn't say I'm not going to college because it's hard, would they? They wouldn't say I'm not going to get a PhD. I'm not going to become a doctor because it's hard. I'm not going to learn how to drive a car because it's hard. You're going to learn how to drive a car because you want your freedom. We want to learn how to do Islam. And, and then driving a car becomes easy. Be, growing the habits of Islam and being a Muslim, it becomes easy. It becomes second nature. It becomes the most beautiful thing of your existence. But the, maybe some of it is hard in the beginning. Ramadan is hard sometimes. Absolutely. I, I was in terrible pain this morning. I, when I, alhamdulillah, I was able to get some sleep so that I woke up feeling better. But sometimes fasting is hard. It doesn't matter in where you are on the path, it can be hard. And that's okay. Like, let's, not, let's stop being afraid of hard things. Let's embrace hard things and recognize that we are willing to do hard things all the time for valuable outcomes. And there's no valuable outcome like the outcome of accomplishing being a good Muslim. What are your thoughts on breastfeeding while fasting? Checking in from South Africa. The, so if you look into breastfeeding, first of all, if you are a normal, healthy woman and you look into breastfeeding, you'll find that the real... Uh, that that which increases your milk the most is actually breastfeeding. It's much. It's not really connected to what our intake is. So if you're going to breastfeed while fasting, the big caution I give is don't stop breastfeeding. A lot of women they're like, okay, I'm fasting now. I'm not going to breastfeed. I'm only going to breastfeed after iftar, and so they give the kids other things during the day. But if you do that, your milk will decrease. So. Definitely, I recommend if you are breastfeeding while fasting, make sure to actually do the breastfeeding. Otherwise, your milk will decrease. And welcome from South Africa. I would love to visit South Africa one day. How to do the shaitani with swask? Become a strong soldier. Become a strong soldier in this battle. Is it? It's been so peaceful without the waswas of shaitan. Is it normal to recognize it not being there? Very good. What a blessing to see that. And how to prepare, prepare for it coming back. You need to prepare, get yourself able to read Baqarah on the regular. Get yourself strong in your worship and in your adhkar. Make sure that you learn how to try to get in the habit of staying in wudu and keeping a tahara environment. Any advice to wipe away anxiety? I feel like I should do all full question and answer tomorrow. Um... I think you should recite the surah Li'ilah Fi Quraysh. But recite it, like sit down with this surah after Fajr, for example, and recite it as a dua. Li'ilah Fi Quraysh. Ilah Fihim. Rihlat al-shita'i wa-sayf. Fal-li'abudu rabba hadha al-bayt. Al-ladhi yata'amahum min ju'in wa'amanahum min khawf. And just really say it. And believe it and know it. And all during the day, if you're feeling a little bit anxious, recite that surah and see if that helps. And of course, that doesn't preclude seeking help if you need it from a therapist. I love that. I feel like shaitan is a bug and we respond to him. Squish him. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody. We reached our half an hour for today. And we'll be back tomorrow for continuation of this enjoyable hadith Ramadan al yomi and have a wonderful day. Remember me in your dua and go to launchgood.com forward slash Rabota and donate and help us make our match. I will be posting on my Instagram when we do make the match. So be part of the khair. Be part of the khair. Do it with the intention that Allah rewards you. SubhanAllah. Whatever you put, may ask Allah, ya Allah, this money, let it go in and Go into everything and give me reward for all of the work. Inshallah. All right. Have a beautiful day. Assalamu alaikum. See you tomorrow.